Gradient echo sequences, probably one of the most commonly discussed family of MRI sequences out there. But how do these sequences actually work and what's the physics behind them? How many types are there and how do they differ from one another? If you're looking to some answers to all these questions, you are in the right place. Today we're gonna dive into the world of gradient echo sequences and we're gonna explore the critical role they play in MRI. So, everything MRI signal to tune. Dear MRI community, after spending plenty of time discussing the turbo spin echo sequences and more recently the inversion recovery techniques, I think it's now time to shift our attention to another major family of MRI sequences, meaning the gradient recall echo, or simply known as gradient echo sequences. In contrast to spin echo sequences, which, as we previously seen on this channel, is this classic combination of a 90 degree excitation pause followed by a 180 refocusing pause, gradient echo sequences step away completely from this structure. Here instead, the echo signal is generated using a single RF excitation pause, but combined with a reversal of the magnetic field gradient, which leads to a key advantage faster imaging. Because they eliminate the time-consuming and energy-intensive 180 refocusing pulse, both the echo time and even more importantly the repetition time can be significantly reduced. And this is also closely tied to another key feature of gradient echo sequences, the use of a small flip angle. This is important because it allows us to preserve a large portion of the longitudinal magnetization along the B0 axis. Since more longitudinal magnetization remains available, it can recover more quickly, allowing, as we were mentioning, a much shorter TR before the next ex excitation pause without causing significant signal saturation. As far as the encoding process is concerned, this is based on applying a dephasing gradient along the readout axis. This gradient intentionally and rapidly disperses the phase of the processing spins, speeding up the dephasing of the transfer magnetization. After this dephasing step, a rephasing gradient of equal magnitude but opposite polarity is applied along the same frequency encoding axis. Now, what happens is this reversal cancels out the phase shift created by the initial gradient. As the spins realign and refocus coherently, they form the signal we know as the gradient recalled echo. As many of you know, there are quite few types of gradient echo sequences, and what is interesting is that they are broadly classified based on how they handle the residual transfer magnetization that remains at the end of each short TR period. And this classification is actually essential because it largely determines the resulting image contrast. One of the most commonly utilized gradient echo variants in clinical MRI is the spoiled gradient echo sequence, or also known by many commercial names like SPGR or FLASH. These sequences are specifically designed to eliminate any remaining transfer magnetization before the next RF excitation pause. The key thing here is that the spoiling process can be achieved either via RF spoiling, so where the phase of successive RF pauses is varied, or through gradient spoiling, so where there are strong crusher gradients that are applied at the end of each TR period. By removing residual transfer coherence, the signal becomes dominated by longitudinal magnetization recovery, and that means strong T1-weighted contrast. And right because of this, spoil gradient take sequences are widely used for rapid T1-weighted imaging, especially in dynamic or uh, post-contrast studies. And a classic example here is the camera, the one we use for angiography. But they are also highly valuable in uh, routine clinical imaging, including brain scans acquired before and post-contrast injection, as well as any other non-contrast angiographic assessment. 
enhancement like the brain MRA or the MRV. So we are talking about sequences essentially like the TOF or, at the, uh, for example, the phase contrast. In contrast to SPGR, other types of gradient echo sequences are often designed to preserve and make use of that residual transfer magnetization that remains from previous TR cycles. And an example of this is the so-called coherent gradient echo sequences. This process is accomplished by rewinding the transfer magnetization, often by reversing the sign of the phase encoding gradients at the end of the TR interval. By maintaining this coherence from one repetition to the next, a steady state free precession is established. In this SSFP state, the resulting signal is actually quite complex and it includes the contributions from multiple previous excitation, which are often described as a combination of feed-like or eco-like components. Within this family of sequences, within SSFP, one definitely stands out, and I believe this is quite familiar to those radiographers, those MR techs that routinely perform cardiac MRI studies. And I'm talking about the balance steady state free precession. Now, this sequence is also often known by other names like TrueFISP, Fiesta, BFFE, and many more others depending on the manufacturer utilized. In BSSFP, all imaging gradients are perfectly balanced, so the net gradient area within HTR is actually equal to zero. This precise symmetry causes all the magnetization pathways to interfere constructively and refocus at the center of the TR, and this produces this very high signal intensity and this characteristic mixed T1 and T2 contrast. These features make BSSFP ideal for cardiac imaging. It is in fact considered the real gold standard for CINE acquisitions because of this excellent signal-to-noise ratio, but also the out outstanding contrast between the myocardium and the blood pool. Even in gradient echo imaging, parameters like TR, TE play a major role in determining the contrast weighting. And this brings us to another key point we need to address. A fundamental consequence of using the gradient echo reversal for refocusing rather than the 180 RF pulse is that the gradient echo sequences are inherently sensitive to magnetic field inhomogeneities. Because the gradient echo reversal only corrects for the phase shift it sort of like intentionally induces, it cannot compensate for the dephasing caused by the imperfections within the magnetic field. To account for this, gradient echo signal decay is often described not only by the T2, but by a combined decay constant called T2 star. You might have heard it before, the T2 star includes both the true T2 relaxation, but also additional dephasing from uh, local field variations. As a result, the T2 star is always shorter than the true T2, and the signal in gradient echo sequences decays more quickly compared to spin echo imaging. From an image contrast perspective, this is very important because gradient echo sequences are highly sensitive to susceptibility and T2 star effects, T2 star weighted gradient echo and their peculiar contrast is actually routinely utilized to detect in very important things like micro microbleeds, calcifications, or also to better visualize any uh, venous structure, for instance. These principles form the foundation of susceptibility weighted imaging, which is nowadays a standard tool utilized as part of many MRI neuroimaging protocol, but is also very valuable in more specialized areas such as, for instance, functional MRI or bold MRI, or also just for quantitative iron assessment, for example. We know that due to differences in electronic shielding, fat protons process at a slightly lower frequency compared to water protons. This difference in frequency causes the transfer magnetization vectors of water and fat to periodically become aligned, so in phase, or 180 degree opposed, meaning out of phase. 
by selecting specific TE values, gradient echo sequences can capture this distinct phase relationship and they're going to give us separate in-phase and out-phase images. And how we can define this sort of like phase-based contrast is definitely diagnostically valuable and this can be in many cases like abdominal imaging uh, where it can help us to assess conditions like fatty infiltration or even the presence of just microscopic fat within a certain lesion. So we have already covered a good portion of the advantages that highlight the value of gradient echo sequences in MRI. We talk about fast imaging, we talk about amazing versatility, the ability of exploit intrinsic physical properties, and there is much more about gradient echo. But for those of you that have been in this channel for a while, and for anyone who works in MRI routinely, you know how it goes there is always another side of that coin. Even gradient echoes come with several disadvantages, and one of these is actually something we already touched on. Because gradient echo sequences lack a 180 degree refocusing pose, they are highly sensitive to magnetic field inhomogeneity and susceptibility differences. As a result, gradient echo is way more prone to susceptibility artifacts compared to spin echo sequences. These artifacts can appear as signal voids and geometric distortions, especially near the ferromagnetic materials, so if we have a metal implant for instance, but also at air tissue interfaces like the skull base or sinuses. In addition, there are certain sequences like balanced steady state free precession that suffer from characteristic bonding artifacts. We mentioned it earlier, BSSFP relies on this coherent summation of multiple steady state signal pathways. Even mild variations in B0 homogeneity cause local resonance frequency shifts, leading to these regions of interference. This interference appears as dark, well-defined bands across the image. What is even more concerning is that all these effects become even more pronounced at 3 Tesla. In fact, susceptibility artifacts grow stronger at higher field strengths, increasing the gap between gradient echo and spin echo performance. Likewise, the greater of resonance sensitivity of BSSFP at 3 Tesla often makes banding but also flow related artifacts way more evident compared to 1.5. And it must be said that in some cases these artifacts can become so prominent that they can significantly hinder the visualization of very important anatomical structures. One effective way to at least mitigate partially these issues is actually through high quality dedicated shimming. In this context, it's very important to make sure that the shim volume is focused specifically to the anatomy we want to image, because a shim that is actually too wide, too broad, won't effectively reduce those local field inhomogeneities. Another useful strategy is relying on the adjustments of some specific MRI parameters. For example, increasing the receiver bandwidth and using a shorter TE are very simple but powerful methods to make sure we reduce that susceptibility related defacing and also we try to minimize artifacts caused by metallic implants. We saw it before on another video, increasing the bandwidth shortens the readout window, which in turn reduces the susceptibility induced distortions near the metal implant, and this can lead to a significantly improved image quality. Trust me, I know it, navigating MRI sequences, and in particular gradient echo sequences, can be quite overwhelming at times. Especially gradient echo can be considered quite a large family of sequences and different MRI manufacturers use a wide range of names for techniques that are fundamentally similar. To help you with that, you can find here a brief comparison table to make it a little bit easier to link each sequence across various vendors. Of course, you're more than welcome to pause the video, take a screenshot if you would like to review this later or perhaps look at specific family of sequences in greater detail. To summarize, gradient echo sequences use a single RF excitation pulse 
combined with a gradient reversal in order to generate the echo signal in contrast to what is the standard uh, scheme of the spin echo sequences, meaning relying on a 180 refocusing pose. Gradient echo also exploit residual transfer magnetization, coherent or spoiled, and the properties of T1, T2 star and chemical shift to achieve a specific type of contrast. Among the pros, we find the adoption of short TR and short TE that allows rapid signal acquisition. Of course, we talk about the great versatility. We use gradient echo in a wide range of clinical application, brain, cardiac and geography, dynamic contrast studies, and much, much more than this. We also mentioned that they inherently exploit physical properties like T2 star sensitivity, and this allows us to detect things like microbleeds and calcifications. But this is not the only thing. We can also exploit the chemical shift in and out of phase imaging for fat and water separation. At the same time, however, we had to acknowledge the great susceptibility of these sequences due to the lack of the 180 refocusing pores, which makes them sensitive to B0 inhomogeneity, the presence of potential metal implants, and also any air tissue interfaces. We also pointed out that they have faster signal loss compared to spin echo sequences, and they can be affected by specific artifacts like banding in BSSFP due to this off resonance effects, and we also mentioned that this tend to get worse at 3 Tesla, for example. Nevertheless, there are some key actions that, from the radiographer's side, we can try to pursue, like a dedicated manual shimming, uh, the selection of specific parameter adjustment, but also the use of derived sequence based on the appropriate clinical indications. And this is, and will always be critical, particularly in gradient echo sequences. And that's pretty much it for our brief overview of gradient echo sequences. There is still much more to say and many, many more applications to explore. Honestly, sometimes I have the feeling that the use of these sequences in clinical imaging is growing so fast and so quickly that it feels it is almost exponential at times. So there will definitely be another video coming to continue this discussion on Gradient Echo. But in the meantime, thank you for watching. And if you found this content valuable, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I will definitely, and I say definitely, see you around.